we have a guest joining us for the top of the show today, Amy Serrato, who's with Pike Off OTA. She's a board member there. Um, this has kind of gotten a little bit of attention around here lately. We've had a couple of calls of my proposed turnpike going through Cleveland County. I met at, uh, Amy at the Capitol uh, this year. She was with a friend of mine, Randy Carter. He uh, worked on a campaign in 1994, and I was working on a different campaign in 1994, but I've known him that long. And he introduced us. And uh, for our audience, Amy, tell us how this kind of came about, how you found out about what the turnpike was going to be in Cleveland County and kind of where they're wanting to run it through. Sure. Thanks, Chad, for having me on. Well, we found out about the Turnpike on February 22nd, along with everyone else, and we were p pretty blown away with the lack of foresight and the lack of planning by the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority to just kind of throw this on the, on the public. And when we started to look into it, these were routes that were very similar to what was proposed in the 1990s. I remember. And that was... That, yeah, that was shot down by the Cleveland County Commissioners at the time and the city of Norman and all of the residents who went up in arms. And uh, Secretary Neil McCaleb, who was the Secretary of Transportation at the time, said, you know, if Norman doesn't want it, we are not going to build it. Mm -hmm. And the citizens of Norman thought it was over, but apparently it wasn't. And they came back again, and we have a lot of the same fighters that were fighting in the 90s with our with our group, Pike Off OTA. And uh, we've had to file some lawsuits to try to slow this down. Um, because they say it's a 15-year plan, but they're trying to have it designed and pull the eminent domain card within the first 8 to 12 months. Right. And so we're just we're trying to do everything we can to tap the brakes on it. And could you kind of give a description for people of where the turnpike would run, uh, just those that are familiar with kind of the Cleveland County Norman area? Sure. The turnpike, there's three different turnpikes. There's a tri-city connector, mm -hmm. which would be on the west side of I-35. And then there's the uh, east-west connector outer loop that would come across on Indian Hills mm -hmm. through Newcastle on Indian Hills across I-35 and then up to Nuwala where the Kickapoo Turnpike comes and hits I-40. Mm -hmm. And then there's this southern connection that starts about Indian Hills and um, around 84th mm -hmm. Avenue mm -hmm. east and then comes down 80th straight down to Etowah and then curves back to the west and hits I-35 right north of Purcell. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm very familiar with all that. Uh, I actually lived in Norman for 30 years. So, okay. uh, what 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 kind of got so many people raised up about being against the turnpike? I'm just saying, what is the op, what is the very strong opposition? Because I'm hearing from everybody I talk to down there, this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Everybody's talking about it right now. Uh, what what are the arguments against why you would want the turnpikes to come in? Sure. Well, I'm a professional civil engineer, so I'll speak to it from an engineering point of view, um, and not only an engineering point of view, but someone who was impacted by these turnpikes. So there is no justification for these new turnpikes. We need to do a better job of fixing the roads we have. Mm -hmm. So we should spend our federal dollars on fixing the intersections on State Route 9, on Indian Hills, on uh, Exit 12 and 12th Street and 19th Street, and all along that I-35 corridor. Um, that would do a lot to alleviate what little congestion they say we have, which is all right around all of those intersections. So there's no engineering justification for these roads. We have State Highway 69 in the eastern part of our state, and then we have the I-27 corridor up through Lubbock and Amarillo to take the big truck traffic out of Texas through our state. We don't need a bypass. Um, we're going right through the Lake Water, Lake Thunderbird watershed, mm -hmm. which is the drinking water for Midwest City, Dell City, and Norman, and it would devastate the already impaired 303D Lake Thunderbird. Uh, we go over the Garber, Garber Wellington with these six lane turnpikes. Um, we're going right through the, the heart of the Barite Roses, the geologic wonder that only occurs in Oklahoma. That's our state rock, the Barite Rose Rock. It would totally destroy that only vein of, in the world. Um, and not only that, but this is the most destructive road construction in Oklahoma's history. It would take out over 600 families that would have to displace in a market that can't 
take them. There's no comparable properties for those people being displaced. We're not talking about subdivisions. We're talking about 10 to 20 to 200 acres right. of land that of homeowners that have been here since the land run that are now going to be displaced okay. in a financial market that's not okay right. and in a housing market that can't support them. And so inter- that's why with we interest rates rising too, the cost of uh, any mortgage is going to be significantly higher than it was six months ago. Um, what is it like dealing with the OTA? And when I say that, I mean that just process wise, because everybody knows if there's a bill to the Capitol, they don't like to call your state representative or the legislature. There's a plan there at a different agency. You know, they have open meetings, hearings, um, you know, public comment. Uh, what was it like trying to deal with the OTA? How did that process work? It's been extremely frustrating. The lack of transparency is devastating. To someone like me, who is a civil engineer, and but also a homeowner, mm-hmm. uh, they are not being forthright about their plans. Their open record requests that we've finally managed to get don't match what they're speaking at their town halls. Their open meetings are just a dog and pony show. We sit there and listen, and we are not allowed, we're not afforded any way to talk back to them and ask them questions. And... Um, I, we feel that you know going around in secret and trying to get all these engineering design firms on board to design these transportation uh, six lane super highways through rural East Norman um, is just the wrong way to go about um, working on transportation problems in the state of Oklahoma. So we would prefer a lot more open dialogue and truthfulness and exactly what is going on, especially because we feel that these routes, you know, the OTA is authorized through the state legislator and we don't feel that these routes are actually authorized, which is why we've sued them to come to the table and explain why they've chosen these routes. Now, what's the status of that lawsuit right now? Um, Well, the first lawsuit, the authorization lawsuit, we're still waiting. We filed a response to their motion to dismiss and we're still waiting for it to be heard but our second lawsuit on what you're talking about how is it like to work with the OTA we feel that they violated the Open Meetings Act and so we have a hearing this Thursday the 4th um, to about the uh, they filed um, I think it's called they're trying to dismiss the, the case and so we uh, have a, a hearing on Friday or on Thursday to um, try to keep it in district court and go forward with our uh, open meetings violation uh, case. Okay. Well, I appreciate you, Amy, for coming on. That's Amy Serrata, who's with Pykoff OTA. She is a board member explaining to us what's going on with the Turnpike in Cleveland County, and we will keep an eye on how those lawsuits turn out. Well, thank you so much, and I uh, hope we can, we can keep you informed and the people of Oklahoma informed on our progress. Absolutely. Amy Serrato, appreciate you very much. You have a great day. Thank you. You too.